and the Son of the Holy Spirit. We begin the month of Kiev, the preparation month for Christmas, with the Gospel of St. Luke. And we begin the story with what St. Luke had wrote as the first thing happening in the New Testament, which is the Annunciation of the birth of St. John to St. Zacharias. And I want to just begin, at least we can focus today on this one, the very first thing that the angel said to Zacharias. This is when heaven is going to start speaking about the good news. Things have been awaited for, everybody's anticipating something big God's going to do. And then this is the first thing that the angel says. Apparently when he showed himself to Zacharias in the temple, it was very unexpected. And the angel said to him, do not be afraid. Zacharias, I tell the kids in, uh, in the garden, first day, he says, you remember four things the angel said in the beginning, four. It's, first of all, he said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias. And he's giving him the reason why he's coming for your prayer is heard. The second thing is, uh, So, do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard. And your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And this is verse number 13 in the first chapter. Again, the four things are, do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard. And your wife, Elizabeth, will bear your son, and you shall call his name John. Four, four phrases the angel put one after another with me, so that Zacharias is comforted. He's not here to rebuke him or scare him, he's here to bring to him very good news. Actually, something he's been praying for. If I move forward to the next vision, I'm going to stop here with Zacharias and we can move forward to the next appearance of the same angel. He's going to say something very similar, but if we can make a little comparison, there's some differences too. The next time he's going to meet or visit, is commission to go and visit St. Mary, the Mother of God. So, we'll move on to verses. Um, 29. First 28, he says to her something. Before he says, don't be afraid. This is different. He actually says to her, rejoice, O full of grace. The Lord is with you, blessed are you among women. And nothing to do with fear. Just immediately, he's greeting her with the greeting we all know. Let's rejoice, O full of grace, the Lord is with you. This is much different. <clears throat> then when she got a little bit alarmed by the greeting, he said there the same thing, but this time it's five. Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found grace with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. It's the same message given to John. He's going to give it in the same sequence. It starts with, do not be afraid, ends up with the name of the child. So that's why do not be afraid, ends up with the name of the child. But this, he doesn't say that your prayer is heard, he said Mary was afraid. And this is next week. She's not praying for a child. She even didn't think that she could have a child. She didn't even have that imagination of being a mother. But she's giving him that the reason is not you. Actually, this time initiated this is God. You found grace from God. Not because you prayed for it. Do not be afraid of me. And this is repeated theme in the New Testament. Do not be afraid. God is not coming to terrorize you or scare you. Why is that? Why is that important? Because this <laughs> was said in the past, in the past when Moses actually got the people out of Egypt and they went to see God and meet God on the mountain, actually eventually they meet God, the God of Israel, they meet him face to face and they get the Ten Commandments. After that is done, they were so 
so afraid that they have to run away from the mountain and stand very far away. So Moses, Moses has to say to the people, uh, he said, Now all the people witnessed the thunderings, the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking, and when the people saw it, they trembled. This is the old covenant. This is the old relationship between God and his people. They saw it, they trembled, and stood far off. Then they said to Moses, You speak with us. We don't want to speak with them. And we will hear. But let no one else speak with us, lest we die. They are afraid to die. And Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to test you, and that his fear may be before you, so that you may not sin. It's a little bit uh, uh, conflicting here. Do not be afraid, but God came to set your fear before you. In the Hebrew language, actually, it is before your face. To set the fear before your face, meaning you turning this, the piece that turns and go everywhere. So what's he saying to them? He's saying, God doesn't want to really scare you. He wants you to know how great he is. And that you will always have God as the greatest being in your mind. That you don't revere or fear anything else. So that to be always maintained in his commandments. That you don't do anything to uh, upset God. So this is a little bit, a little bit delicate thing. So in the Old Testament, God had made an impression on people by lightning, thundering, flashes, sound of trumpet, and mountain smoking. And because of their fear of death, they ran away. They didn't want to come near them because they said, "We're gonna die." To come close to God, that means our death. The devil used this. The devil has been using this from day one, from the time of Adam. Remember when Adam had, and he had to hide. Why were they hiding? They said to God two things. We were naked and we were afraid. So the New Testament teaches us something about this. And, then, and I want to just go one step at a time about this fear that actually bound all of us. In the book of letter to the Hebrews, there is a little verse here that's very uh, kind of eye-opener. Talks about the incarnation of Christ, the coming of Christ. It says in verse 14, chapter 2 in the Hebrews, inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, all of us. We, were, we took some from Adam and Eve, which is our flesh and blood, that is liable to die. We are under death. He, with the capital H, that's Christ, himself likewise, shared in the same flesh and blood, became human. That through death, he might destroy him, the small H, that's the devil, who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through the fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Okay, what's the same? Verse 15 comes first. Jesus came so that actually destroys the devil. He came to destroy the devil and to take from under the bondage of the devil those who through fear were servants, slaves, under the devil. Why? Who's your friend of God? They're afraid of God. What does this say? Fear calls for humanity, like this. Sometimes little kids and us, not thinking very deeply, we think fear of death means something imminent right now is going to happen, and it's about the short term effects of death on us. Sickness. You know, when somebody hears that they have cancer, God protect everyone. Be a little bit scared. They start preparing themselves. They go into the phases of uh, the, the grief process, the, the, the denial, the bargain, the anger, the depression. And they have this happening. This is very short term. But you know that all of us are under death through our actions and planning and thoughts. We're, we behave like, we behave like prisoners. I'll tell you how. 
And I said this before, and if you read me, please uh, just bear with me if I say it again. Any man has in his mind, or any boy has in his mind, a certain agenda. It says, by age 30, I have to finish studying, get my work, you know, settled, have my, have my house, my family. If I get a little bit later, later than that, I might miss it. I might not have a sort of wife, I might not have a sort of job, and I need to get done by 30, 35. Any girl approaching the age of 30 again, she's thinking, I am not married. OMG. I might not make it. Okay, why is that? Because both of them thinking as dying means they're going to die. And if they don't get these things accomplished before their death, they die unaccomplished. And what the sadness, what the sorrow, what the fear that this produces. So in long term effects of fear, really, it has everybody under that grip. So what did Jesus come to do? Think about it. Listen to me. We all start. We all start from resurrection. We begin our life not from birth. Our life begins when we are risen from the dead. So we should have the mentality, the attitude, the vision of undying people. Never. You're going to live forever. How are you going to live? How are you going to live? And how are you going to plan your life if you're never going to die? That's why Jesus doesn't speak about death as death. He speaks of it as when he spoke about Lazarus, what did he say? Sleep. He's asleep. Pope Proverbs used to say this in our, uh, in our uh, praise of uh, or uh, the, the song we gave to Pope Proverbs. He said, He called death traveling. Because the soul that God is going to preserve and re remake our bodies again never dies. It just moves from this world to some other reality. But then a human being who is out of the grip of death thinks totally different. Many writers and many philosophers have tried to look into this. One of the people is Tolkien in his Lord of the Ring thing. When he put together the story, he said, I want to have in this story a race that does not die. I mean, he, he made the elves. They don't die. If they live thousands of years, they continue on living. And how they are, how they behave, how we behave. Will we get will be getting angry for everything that we get angry with now? Will you be getting anxious for everything we get anxious now? Are our ambitions and plans and everything we do is going to be the same? This is the This is exactly what Jesus came for. That we he brings us from the power of death. That's why he was a human being. Basically, Jesus was incarnate in the womb of St. Mary that he dies, and through his death, he would tremble over death. Death, the cross of resurrection, was in the mind of the Son as he was in the womb of St. Mary. This is extremely important for us. We're not just celebrating the humanity of Christ, and this is what sometimes I say what's the difference between the East and the West <coughs> in practices? One of my spiritual guides used to tell me the difference between East and West can be summarized in the, what feast they celebrate the most. In the West, which feast is celebrated the most and makes the biggest hit everywhere? It is Christmas. And what feast do you celebrate in the East that makes it the biggest feast, called the Great Feast? The Resurrection. The two are actually two sides of one point. But the West looks at the life here, our life here, which is it's just good that we should enjoy our life here, the humanity. God became man and He cancelled our fear. He gave us a chance to live a much better life by taking everything we do and He's doing it. He works, He's a son, He's a friend, He's a disciple, He's a bridegroom, He's a giver, 
he is hungry, he is thirsty, everything we do. But in the resurrection, what is happening? He takes us and brings us to the everlasting world. Takes us to bring us to God, to become God like. And the two is needed. If he doesn't come down to be like us, he cannot take us to be like him. So fear is the first enemy to be defeated. And death will be the last enemy to be defeated. But between the fear and the fear of death is our whole life. So what can we take from this? When the angel says to Zechariah, at the beginning of the gospel, do not be afraid. We think that God is saying it to our us. Someone said it, and I'm not really, I didn't do the, the, the work myself. They say that there was actually 366 times, do not be afraid of that. But 366, why not 65? Because it said if you have a, a, a leap year, you shouldn't panic. Even that one more day is covered. It's covered. So if you live and you're not gonna, as if you're not gonna die, how would you take this verse? How would you take it? And in many ways, Jesus said the same thing to many people. He said that to his disciples, when they're panicking, the, the storm is very high and the water is going to fill the ship and we're gonna all sink and perish. And Jesus said, you, you, you lack faith. I'm, I'm in the ship, how can it perish? And then with the, the father of the daughter, the Jairus, whose daughter was dead, people were around him saying, oh, just don't listen to this crazy person, she's dead. We know what the dead person looks like, she's dead. And Jesus tells him, do not be afraid, just believe. And here Jesus puts it very clearly that medicine for fear is, the medicine for fear is faith. To be not afraid, you have to trust God. And it's from beginning to end, when God wanted to comfort the best person that we know about faith, in, in Genesis 15, he started saying the same thing. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision saying, Do not be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. Why Abraham was afraid? Because you're going to see that he is going without children. That's the third one. I didn't I miss that one. When a, when a wife or a husband are not able to have children, you say, well, you're going to die without children. Go over and have mercy. Go over. What is this? It's panic. Panic. Okay. So this is what God is doing to Abraham, although he was very old. So we have to understand. Fear means we need to go back to our faith and review what we believe and what we hold with God. And to say, no, I don't know, is a sad thing. The, the, the Old Testament is filled with this. Many kings and many prophets had to struggle over this idea that God will support you. And sometimes the faith says, maybe it is not for me, but if I don't take something in this life, I'm taking it there. Many martyrs. Many saints, abandoned families, abandoned fields, abandoned work, abandoned life itself because they trust them will be, that's their faith. There will be a reward for them. They will have much more in the life to come than to receive it here. That's faith. It doesn't always have to be now and here. It does not. But we know that there is a just God who will give everyone just fear. Remember the story of uh, Lazarus, when the rich man says, I don't want to give him anything. It's not my responsibility. I'll eat and drink and be happy. And when he goes up uh, out of this life, Abraham tells him, you got what you deserve in this, in this life. And he did not get anything. It's only fair that he gets something. So we trust that God is just and fair. And that he will give us what we need. But one thing we should never do is to be afraid of death in the short term and in the long term. Do not be afraid of death because it's going to happen now. Maybe we can be saying, and some of us will say this, including myself, we are afraid of pain and suffering. But you should never be afraid of death. Death is not something bad at all. On the long term, I'm going to have to think every day, I'm going to live forever. 
Why, why is that heavy? What am I really heavy for? I have all the time in eternity. I have all the time. May the God of faith and the God of righteousness and, and peace fill our hearts in this season as we prepare for the, the, the Christmas, the birth, the nativity, uh, with the courage. And one of the things we should do is maybe it's about time to abandon some food. Which is not bad, you know. We're not gonna run out of food. Food will always be there. So to, to live as an undying people, fasting is okay. Right? Undying people means we have all the time to eat what we need to eat and there will be more. So abandoning it for a little bit is not a big deal. So do not be afraid, you're not gonna be deprived of anything that you enjoy. May God uh, bless all, all of you and, and help us to uh, experience the joy of the season and to fill in the spiritual instead of the material and to fill in with the courage that defies the fear was the Christ our Lord became human being for us to help us. The hymn is a good father who is right now forever.